Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the panel discussion on fake news and the 2017 general election. Uh, this panel discussion is under the auspices of the Media in the Public Interest Project and I'd like to thank Dr Maria Armudian and Associate Professor Luke Good up there uh, for making it possible. Also I'd like to thank Dr Suzanne Woodward and Tim Page for their work in the event. Now let me introduce the panel. First of all, a face that many of you I'm sure are familiar with, Corin Dan, the political editor of Television New Zealand. Uh, he's been political editor since 2012, uh, had a stint before that hosting business and breakfast shows on TV1, and before that uh, was a political reporter in the press gallery for both Radio New Zealand and News Talk ZB. At the other end, Mark Jennings, who is the co-founder with Tim Murphy of Newsroom, which started uh, this March, I think it was, and I hope you all religiously look at it each day. Um, he's worked in broadcasting in Australia and New Zealand, uh, and for many years, of course, was head of news and current affairs at MediaWorks. Um, before he left MediaWorks a year ago, about a year ago, um, he established News Hub across TV3 and uh, Radio Live, and he now writes about the media industry, business, and the tertiary sector on Newsroom. Chloe Swarbrick. In 2015, Chloe did something at first quite ordinary. She started interviewing candidates in the mayoral election and then she decided well the quality isn't all that high so, <laughs> so decided to stand herself and with a very very small budget but the help of a lot of a lot of uh, people uh, she did extraordinarily well and came in third with 30,000 votes so hardly surprising that after the mayoral campaign she became a Green Party member and is standing as a Green candidate in the forthcoming election where at number nine on the party list I think we're looking at an MP. <laughs> on my right Dr uh, Armudian um, who is the leader of the Media and the Public Interest Project, uh, is a lecturer in politics and international relations in the School of Social Sciences here at Auckland University. The author of two books, Kill the Messenger, The Media's Role in the Fate of the World, and her latest book, Reporting from the Danger Zone, uh, which includes um, one of the two people who uh, were involved in a rather recent controversy over Afghanistan. Uh, she's also widely published in uh, American and New Zealand media and prior to her academic career she served as a commissioner in the city of Los Angeles for six years. Now by a process of elimination that means I'm Gavin Ellis <laughs> and uh, I'm something of a poacher turned gamekeeper. I had a 40 year career in journalism before I became a senior lecturer first in politics and uh, latterly in media and communications here at the university. Last year I wrote a book, Complacent Nation, which examined the manipulation of our access to official information. And of course, fake news just makes that all the more manipulated. Bit of housekeeping, um, easy to see where the exits are. Uh, in the event of an emergency, please stay calm, move in an orderly fashion to the doors. Um, there'll be a period at the end uh, well, not at the end. After about 40 minutes, we'll throw the uh, questioning open to the, to the floor. Um, please hold your questions until we get to that part of, of the program. And this is an opportunity to seek the views of a pretty impressive panel. So please ask questions rather than making statements. Um, we do intend to audio record the session uh, and hopefully it will uh, end up as a podcast so just be aware that uh, it is being recorded. Now fake news uh, sounds like a very simple thing but in fact uh, it's not as simple as you think because there are 
numerous definitions of what constitutes fake news. The first and probably the, the, the most dangerous uh, is a falsehood deliberately distributed to undermine a person or an institution. There are also falsehoods distributed for, for financial gain. Now we saw this with Macedonian um, interests in the American uh, presidential election where they made a lot of money out of click-based advertising on social media. There's also the possibility of parody and satire that's generated as parody and satire but distributed via social media as if it was fact. That also is fake news. Then there's bad journalism. <laughs> Just running unsubstantiated stories. And we saw that with the publication of the, the so-called Trump Russian uh, material uh, that was run on BuzzFeed without any attempt to check its veracity or otherwise. And then there's Mr Trump's own version of fake news. This is news that we want to be false even if it's true, uh, simply because it's inconvenient or it's ideologically unpalatable. And this is where we have President Trump's fake news media. We've always had spin and I think that we might differentiate spin from fake news uh, because spin tends to be the manipulation of facts for your own interest, um, highlighting some, forgetting others, but um, perhaps we can leave spin to another day. But what we might consider is adding substitution news to fake news, and this is news that isn't really news at all that runs in our news media, at the tops of bulletins sometimes, or on the front page, uh, in place of what we might regard as substantial information. These are entertainment news, info news, uh, uh, entertainment news, if you like, or um, the promotion of material that once may have been a brief, but is now a front page lead. Now, there are probably other definitions that will come along uh, as we speak as well, but let's leave it at the moment at those six definitions and let me put a general question to, to all of the panel. Um, we've seen all of those forms of fake news uh, preceding polls in other countries, so what do you think the shape of fake news will be in our upcoming general election? Let's start at this end with... But I don't think it'll be anywhere near as bad as we've seen in the US. Um, I think, for a start, our politicians, and Chloe will be pleased to hear this, are a lot less corrupt, um, are, are more trustworthy. Um, I mean, there's a definition that says, how do you tell a, if a politician's lying, <coughs> excuse me, if, he, if a politician is lying, his lips are moving. Um, so, but I think that that is harsh, and I think generally we have a clean political system. But I do think there will be an issue around confirmation bias, um, and be interesting to hear Chloe's views on that because it mainly comes from social media. I think there's a growing trend in this country as well as um, other countries for people to hear what they want to hear. Um, and that's a dangerous thing and it's sort of being fueled up, I think, around fake news and that's why fake news is getting this uh, prominence or attention. But it's really about confirmation bias and um, that comes right back to a sort of democracy issue in my view. But I, I don't think we're going to experience anything like uh, what we've seen in America. I mean, that the biggest story I think out of fake news there was when the Pope allegedly endorsed Donald Trump. Well, we just don't, we're just not going to have that here, are we? Um, so I think it's, it's less of a, a problem here, but I do think we'll have confirmation bias problems and I do think we'll have news manipulation um, absolutely, um, and we need to look out for that. 
Yeah, I think we've got um, a major issue with a lack of funding for public interest journalism at the moment and with the major reliance that we've got on mainstream media sources, uh, the mainstream media by and large has a commercial imperative. So uh, what it seems that we're seeing uh, is an imperative to go for clickbait quite frequently over substance, although we do find uh, in a lot of instances there is a bit of a renaissance for longer form journalism. Um, so that funding issue I think is really at the heart of uh, this context of this issue of fake news uh, because that in and of itself then prompts obviously in terms of where uh, these outlets are getting their funding from does that uh, mean that there is then bias there. Uh, there's also a blurring of the lines of who is a journalist uh, in this modern day. Uh, obviously now we've got bloggers, <laughs> uh, the likes of Cameron Slater, David Farrer, uh, so I think that that uh, mixed with the, not necessarily issue, uh, but for lack of a better word, the issue of social media uh, and the framing with which information is put out there and shared, uh, we've got a recipe for very interesting times. I certainly agree with uh, both Mark and Chloe on this. Uh, that the One of the things that I've said about fake news is that it really is the economic model gone wild in that if, if financial gain and raising your stock prices and increasing uh, the bottom line is the only motivation for the news one puts out, um, then fake news is actually just the extreme of that. Now, the one other difference that they haven't pointed out between like the United States versus New Zealand, a couple of things really. One is that, that there's such a focus on singular people in the United States. Um, so just such a focus on Donald Trump rather than on parties like we have here. Um, I moderated a debate of the parties for the AUSA last week, and not only do I find it less corrupt, like Mark said, but there was actually discussion about policy issues. <laughs> there was, and there was no like personal attack between the candidates and party representatives like you would have in the United States. There was disagreement, but everybody brought material forward that sort of substantiated their arguments, I mean, obviously some more than others, but you wouldn't have that in the United States. It is so polarized and so sound-bited, uh, sound-bitten, I should say, <laughs> um, and so personalized, um, and, that's, and that is the economic model. I mean, it's because the economic model has gone so far off the rails, but here we still talk policy. We don't talk about it enough. We don't talk about it in the, ma in the depth that we need, but at least there is policy discussion. Corin, you challenged there. So. Well, there wasn't that much policy discussion, you could argue, in the last election <laughs> because we were dominated by dirty politics. And from my perspective, as someone who was on the, at the coalface of making decisions daily about what made the bulletin and what didn't, um, I'm not sure commercial imperatives came into it. It was um, a highly pressurised, very difficult environment where we had to deal with um, source documents, uh, emails, you know, leaked stuff, the raw shark stuff, all that stuff. It was a very difficult period. And I, I agree with Mark in that I don't think we're going to suddenly see a whole bunch of fake news turning up from Macedonia that's going to influence our election. But I am extremely wary of the possibility that there is going to be in this campaign something that turns up where people like myself, people like Paddy Gower, others in newsrooms are going to have to make hard decisions about information under pressure. I guess there is some commercial imperative in that there'll be competitive pressures um, to be first and those sorts of things. I would like to think that when it comes to television news, the one thing we have in our favour is uh, a lot of people involved in the process of putting it to air and that there are a lot of eyeballs and that hopefully we will pick up any um, fake document or, or, or something that's false along the way. But I am wary of it given what's happened and I think we did see a, a sort of example of it in the last election in the moment of truth when a email surfaced very late in the piece the last week. Um, I think it was only published by the, or the New Zealand Herald got hold of it. It was this email where supposedly linking uh, Warner Brothers to the um, key in Warner Brothers, it was .com's moment of truth email. Now he never produced it in the actual moment of truth uh, meeting, but that document was 
pretty quickly dismissed as fake by a lot of people. It was never produced and there was never any outcome to see whether it was or wasn't. But um, thankfully I think there was a fair degree of scepticism there, possibly by some of the other journalists involved in that, that process. But I do think we have to be um, extremely wary for the possibility of it in this campaign. Yeah, but there, cause one more thing I'd like to add about the difference and why we won't see as much in the U.S. I was just thinking about, um, uh, which is that the Macedonians did that because they made so much money and because the United States and because of Donald Trump, they didn't circulate others because they didn't make money on the others. But they said as much that that's the sole reason that they did that. The second thing is the whole issue of countries like Russia getting involved is because they wanted to have a say in the end result. And the U.S. has so much more at stake in that fight. So that's another reason why I feel like New Zealand is not quite going to feel the same kind of pressure. Yeah. Um, one thing about the digital uh, end of, of media is that increasingly we're seeing the ability of reporters to publish direct to the web. Fewer and fewer checks and balances being put uh, in the, uh, into the process. Do you think that that increases the possibility of fake news from whatever, whatever source uh, getting into mainstream media, you know, beyond the um, the echo chambers of social media, but into mainstream media because we're lacking the checks and balances that we once had. Yes, I do a bit. Um, I, I think we've seen, um, as Chloe also alluded to, the economic model has completely changed. Um, you know, sub-editors are virtually disappearing out of the media. And the checks and balances aren't quite the same. I take Corin's point that I think the television newsrooms with a lot of hands um, are right down to people still physically editing it. It's not being done by robots uh, yet. Um, is is <laughs> yeah is is helping. But I think probably what where things might go off the rails a bit is some small provincial newspaper um, gets sucked in and out it comes. Um, and I think you, in the talk we had beforehand, Saturday afternoon, only one or two people on, something lands just before deadline, um, inexperience comes into play and suddenly it's in. Uh, so yeah, I think there is a little bit more vulnerability in the system, but that's happening to the media all around the world. I mean, there's, there's one thing I think, um, and I'm sure we're going to get onto this, is Facebook and Google's responsibility uh, in this area. They've been putting a lot of money into uh, Europe, Europe uh, in terms of fact-checking, and I would really like to see us push for something like that here. Um, f those two organisations seem to completely ignore this country in terms of any investment. Um, they, they take everything out, they put nothing back in. And it, I think the media as a whole should be calling on them to say, all right, fund two or three or four people to be fact-checking for the election and we can all submit stuff to them if, it's, if we think it's dodgy. Um, that's something I'd like to see. Um, yeah, just returning kind of to that financial issue, I really think that that is a, a crucial point there. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at regional newspapers as well, uh, <laughs> the amount of times that I have seen press releases published just as articles, you know, without a byline is quite disconcerting. Uh, but yeah, without those checks and balances and further with the money being sucked out of journalism, the amount of ex-journalists who have turned to work in PR or who have turned to work in uh, kind of political party uh, media rooms it is quite disconcerting so um, it really is a matter of I guess as well one question which I wanted to raise with you Corin and uh, talking about there not potentially uh, being that bias per se and lots of eyeballs being on it hoping to produce some kind of objective content uh, is who decides what the value is of, of certain pieces of media? I mean, what do you choose to produce? Uh, so th an example of that being uh, during the local government campaign last year, don't mean to rehash it, but uh, I, I was ignored by and large, if you know what I mean, and that's because I understand there were 19 odd candidates in the running for the Auckland mayoralty, but uh, it, it was just interesting who the mainstream media decided to choose as the deemed top four candidates, which can produce a 
bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that respect. Are you just asking me to comment on why I make news judgments? Yeah, I, I yeah, and I'm not I'm not having a go. No, I'm no, just, no, yeah. it's perfectly fine. I have <laughs> yeah. to be able to I have to be able I to just, justify I why I make my decisions yeah. and why anyone makes their decisions. Um, the same way I hope most journalists do, using a, a, a whole bunch of uh, principles and values and huge ju news judgment that's built up over years of being a reporter, and you know, it's it's a it, it is exactly that. It is experience and it is uh, judgment that you build up over a long period of time, and you know you're held accountable ultimately ultimately by the viewers, by your peers if you get that wrong. And I think you've got to get it consistently right over a long period of time, and then you build up trust and credibility. I don't know any other way. Mm. Mind you, having been there, I can say you will please none of the people most of the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I um, What I'm kind of getting at is the potential issue of uh, traditional media propping up the institution, the traditional institutions, if you know what I mean. Yeah, but uh, are, they, an, an are they likely to, to be, to be the, the, the focus of fake news, though? Uh, isn't that simply a matter of, of um, the sort of institutional bias that's always been present in, mm. particularly in political choices? But come back to fake news. Mm. Now, do you think that... The sort of processes, the sort of values uh, that Corin talks about are more or less likely to filter out fake news given that they have these preconceptions of who's valuable, who isn't. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that they definitely speak to some form of implicit bias insofar as obviously who gets coverage. And it's, it's more that self-fulfilling prophecy, um, which, for lack of a better word, can be concerning. Uh, and it's also the fact that, you know, with this focus on traditional media, uh, for all intents and purposes, kind of, you know, reporting on institutional traditions. Uh, the, in the US, that resulted in missing Trump, if you know what I mean. Trump kind of seeming to come left of field. So it seems as though that kind of provides a gap for fake news. I'm not sure if I'm necessarily pointing to an issue there, but I'm just mulling on the idea. No, I mean, I, I think... Um you know, we live and die chasing stories, you know, it's that simple, you know, and on a daily basis, our judgment is based on, is it a good story? Does it need to be told? Does it not need to be told? You know, is it, you know, is that a better story than that story? Which one gets in? It, it's not that complicated. It's quite, you know, we're actually pretty simple beasts, really. I do think there's a status quo bias in traditional media, and it's, the, it's a similar dynamic that you saw with Bernie Sanders in the United States, where he was completely ignored most of the time by most outlets, and even with the ignoring of Bernie Sanders, he really gave Hillary Clinton a run for her money and could have potentially won that uh, uh, nomination had there not been additional factors. Yeah, but that was, that was more uh, a matter of preference rather than fake news, wasn't it? Mark, if I, if I was in your newsroom and I received... You'd be welcome, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I think you've uh, just got hired. That, that's only because he doesn't have enough. It's no, nothing to do with my ability. Um, if you received a press release on an official letterhead from the Ripley Research Institute, PO Box 2239, Lambton Key, and it was about research-based findings, are you likely to run that without verifying it? Um, no, the first place it's likely to go is the bin. Because um, uh, I've never, Why? well, I've never heard of the Ripley Institute or whatever it is. Well, um, I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> That's fake news. <laughs> um, possibly I'd Google it, but then that might lead me into fake news as well. So, um, no, look, I think again, I can only speak for our outfit, but because Corin made a point before about years and years of experience. Uh, and how he relied on that. I guess that is a big key, and um, and it's what all the big mainstream news organisations have relied on, the Herald, uh, Fairfax, TVNZ, TV3. Having very experienced journalists um, sitting in their newsrooms, 
I think an experienced journalist immediately can smell something straight away when it's not quite right. You know, P.O. Box 145, uh, Lambton Key, um, Ripley, uh, this, never heard of it, doesn't really make sense. Um, you know, even the phone number and who to contact, you go straight down to that and uh, make the call. I also, I think, um, you know, newsrooms like ours, which are a little bit different because we're not, and I think this is another dangerous thing that we're seeing happening at the moment, and I'll be interested in your comments on it, Gavin. The Herald and Stuff are in a race, and the speed at which they match each other is, I've watched it, it's absolutely frightening. A story can go up on one of them, and the other one's got it up in within about five minutes. You know they have not been able to check the facts on that. They've copied them. So if the first one gets it wrong, they both get it wrong. And, and I've seen it. They both had to apologise um, for making mistakes. I think in our newsroom, um, we, we're not competing on a daily or, or actually a minute-by-minute minute <coughs> basis. So we've got a bit more time to sit back, reflect on it, and then check the facts. Where I worry is that all the media are, are getting, and you know, you'll see News Hub and TVNZ starting to get sucked into this too, of trying to match each other, and the whole speed thing is becoming a real issue. And that's, that's fake news' ally and the media's enemy. I agree with that entirely. You, you, you get faced with pack journalism every day. Yeah, um, but I agree with it that, that there is a, a pressure on our website to, to match, and I do agree that the speed is the worry, and it is a worry for me that I'm not so worried about what gets on the TV news, but I am more worried about stuff slipping through online. Um, you talk about status quo uh, bias. Um, I, I just got to answer that in that... Um, you know, I know it, it, some people can't believe it, and they, I get plenty of interesting comments on Twitter and feedback. But you know, I don't have an agenda, right? I don't have an, I don't have a pre preconceived agenda. I do like to try and think of myself as a referee. And what really um, worries me about fake news um, more so is a situation, like I say, a debate that's been raging on Twitter over the last 24 hours or whatever how long. Um, health funding. So you've got. Um, Labour out there ramming at social media really, really hard saying health funding has been cut $1.7 billion for the last few years, it's now been cut $2.3 billion. Of course it hasn't been cut per se, it has been underfunded. So Labour's out there saying your health budget's been cut, National's saying no it's not, we've actually increased the funding, which is of course true, but if you take it on a per capita basis and you know, in inflation then you might argue that it's been underfunded, at which point National says oh no, 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 but we've got more discipline and they don't spend, need as much money now, so it's all fine. We're, now the media, the mainstream media can outline, put those arguments out, both sides, it can present it and say hey look this is what's going on, it might get one or two runs on 6pm news, might get on Q&A and it's gone. And then those two, those political parties will just absolutely smash those two ideas which are completely opposite for the next six weeks in a campaign and the public is none the wiser. So that's what worries me. But Chloe, doesn't that get picked up by social media and take on a life of its own there? Don't those, those issues... Um, become even more polarised on social media and give rise to the possibility, uh, and I think this is where we may see fake news uh, come in, of elements of fake news being inserted between legitimate Absol opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that polarisation is actually probably the major issue. Um, it looks as though with the new Beta uh, New Zealand Herald website at the moment as well that uh, they've gone down the route of curating your feed uh, or you know the landing page on the New Zealand Herald's website to your interests. That's what it looks like at the moment. And if that is the case, that's incredibly disconcerting because that's one type of the fake news that you were talking about insofar as it feeds back your ideologies uh, and you know results in the self-confirmation bias which is which is really quite concerning uh, and if you look at debates on the likes of Twitter it's 140 characters uh, and New Zealand Twitter is actually quite small there's about um, 1500 odd characters on there uh, and we've all got our sides and in 140 characters people will be lobbying back forward and back, they're, for all intents and purposes, often quite, quite often their dogma. 
uh, and there isn't a space there because there isn't the length uh, or you know the space really to, to have that uh, open discourse and it would seem that that results in people becoming increasingly hostile towards those who disagree with them uh, which I think we've definitely seen in the US in particular. Yeah. And aren't there also plenty of places to hide on social media? You do not have to use well, your real identity, for example. On, on Twitter in particular, uh, absolutely, there's, there's quite the level of anonymity afforded to people. But what really surprises me about the likes of Facebook uh, and kind of the vitriol that you can encounter on Facebook, which obviously I have given that now I'm in the public sphere, uh, is quite frequently um, those people who are posting those really nasty comments, you'll be able to click through their profile uh, and you'll see that they, they have children and dogs and um, they haven't, you know, quite frequently, um, and I, I don't mean this um, as any kind of uh, attack, but quite frequently they are actually baby boomers who don't seem to also understand the security and privacy measures that they can put in place. So so they're putting out all of these really nasty comments uh, and you, you know exactly who they are. And... Yeah, that's just more an interesting that, observation that, that than actually, anything. Yeah, that raises an interesting point. If you can identify the purveyor of fake news, is it incumbent upon the mainstream media in particular to call out those, those, those people to, to show them up for what they are? Do you think we're going to see that happen? Sure, if we get the opportunity to, that would be a good story. You know, if somebody, if there is somebody produces a fake email or a fake document, yeah, absolutely. What about will. if you ran the story in the first place? Well, you're going to admit your mistake. You're going to have to, yeah, and you're going to have to do it fast, and you're going to have to do it in a fulsome way. Absolutely. Everybody going to do that? You think? Um, I'm, I'm sure that the Herald and stuff would put it in a very uh, hidden place. Um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, if you, you I, I think it's one of, of you know an indictment of the media that when they make a mistake, they don't fulsomely own up to it. I think the TV channels are better than the newspapers, frankly. Um, you know, I don't know why. Uh, when something's wrong and it's blasted across the front page, the apology is hidden on the bottom of page three somewhere. Um, Gavin, I mean, you might have a view on that, but it's 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 not a very open and honest culture when it comes to mistakes. Well, I, I had a corrections and clarifications column. That's true. either on page two or three, I can't yeah. remember now. I, I worry about this a lot because there will be mistakes. There always are. People will make mistakes and... Uh, you know, I, I say to my guys, you know, that if, if we do make one little mis little mistake in what can otherwise be a good story, the subject of that story who might have a complaint will turn around and use that and they will call it fake news. I mean, that's a real worry. And that will happen more in this campaign. If you get something a tiny little bit wrong, Winston or somebody like that who didn't particularly like your story will call, turn around and call it fake news. I mean, you already... He already calls our polls fake, so it's uh, not much of a. He's been doing perhaps, that for years. Yeah, but I mean, perhaps the irony of the terminology itself, fake news, is that it's something that was coined by Donald Trump. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so. That's well, in that context, it was. It, yeah. It's actually been around for a bit longer than oh, that, yeah. but but it's been popularised. <laughs> but um, the other thing that which I just also wanted to touch on is in talking about uh, kind of news stories that are created off the back of uh, something, some kind of transactions online, um, predominantly often through Twitter. You know people's responses to things are quite an interesting news trend appearing at the moment. Uh, there does seem to be this picking and choosing of certain responses to curate uh, a public perception of something which you know supports the story or the headline and that to me speaks to being at, there's quite a lot of parallels between what the media has been criticised for in the past which is you know being at protests and only filming the people who fit the perception of what a protester is the happy or the radical or what have you. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that, that picking up these um, tweets and inserting them into news stories, and we see it all the time increasingly, I find it bloody irritating, to be honest. It, it interrupts the flow. It seems like a, a cheap and easy way of filling out a news story to me. But aren't those tweets and the way that they're used on websites the ideal vehicle for inserting fake news? Yeah, but they are edited in a sense. You're, you know, they're not being just put in there without anybody looking at them. I mean, you could argue that uh, vox pops and TV stories are a similar thing, but I'm like you, I don't like them either. 
I don't think they... I, I didn't like Vox Pops when I was um, running MediaWorks News either, because they're actually usually uninformed, useless comments from people. Um, so I think you see the same thing when they go into um, print stories. Yeah, I, I don't think they should be in there at all. Yeah, but here we've got, you know, you, you have people, a running I, news yeah. story, a can running I, news story yes. that's running live. Can I, can I just go back to a, a, a really interesting point? I had a discussion with um, a press secretary from one of the political parties uh, recently, and he was saying that essentially a, a lot of the um, news uh, web journalists these days do not interview politicians. They're doing a story in such speed, they leave little gaps for statements from the politician or party. They want them emailed from the press secretaries um, to the web uh, outfit, whether it's Stuff or, or Herald or some other uh, web. They just want a statement. They don't want an interview. They just want to drop in the response. So, you know, that that is something that's, I think, a really, again, problematic, that we're not interviewing politicians, we're not testing them. We're lucky that we do have Q&A in the nation, frankly. Um, those programs are ghettoised, as um, Corin will know, but at least we have them, and I think that's something. What about live television, Corin? You know, the, the, the the stuff that we're talking about running stories on websites and how easy it is to uh, to uh, put fake news into into those. But what about live interviews, live television? Are you vulnerable? We're, we're always vulnerable on breaking stories. So if there's a massive terrorist attack somewhere or a crisis and the information is sketchy and it's coming in and then there's a temptation to just throw stuff up. AP says this, Reuters says this, and it might be wrong. What about live interviews, though? Um, the difficulty I've had in the past with live interviews can be that uh, I've found with this government at times, um, locking horns with Key or Joyce, uh, you will put a particular uh, argument together on the basis that there's with some solid data and they will just say, no, that data's wrong, don't accept it. And then you'll end up in a scrap over whether you can use a labour cost index to measure wage in wages or a quarterly employment survey. And Joyce is like, no, you have to use the labour cost index or you have to use the quarterly employment survey. And you've wasted two minutes of your three minutes of your interview. The audience is going, oh, stuff this. I don't know what to believe. And they've won. That's what they wanted. And that, that's frustrating. And then, and, and you have to, you have to, then you ha so you go into interviews now thinking, how am I going to figure my way around that and not fall into that trap? Yeah. Uh, Maria... We've seen some horrendous fake news in, in uh, the United States. Probably the worst of it is Pizzagate, where um, the notion of the Democrats having a pedophile ring run out of a pizza parlour in Washington led to that pizza parlour being shot up by somebody who believed it. That can't happen here, can it? <laughs> can we, we're not that gullible. Well, okay, so we're human. Um, and when you say we, of course, we're not all the same. There's quite a variation in every society. Um, You're a Kiwi now. I, I'm a Kiwi now. Um, I, and I'm practicing, practicing saying talk in Auckland. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm getting there, but <laughs> um, just not natural yet. But when you know, with the first time I ever did a, this is just anecdotal. First time I ever did a television interview here, uh, which was a morning program on TV3, no names mentioned. Um, but it was when Hillary Clinton had um, announced her candidacy, and s I went on the program with one intent, and I delivered it, which is to talk about the structure of the U.S. government and the structure of the electoral politics and all that sort of thing. I went home and then to the office, and I had hate email. I had hate phone calls repeated. And then a few days later, I got hate letters. And they were terrifying because they said things like, how dare you not call her out on her pedophile rings and her and, and cocaine, whatever. I can't remember all of the conspiracy theories. This was even before Pizzagate. And, and so it's very clear that Fake news travels past, you know, Pacific Oceans and borders and that sort of a thing. People can get this material off of anywhere. And the conspiracies around the Clintons, um, it, you know, have been so permeating uh, the public space that people, 
here in New Zealand are reading it and believing it. And the, what was terrifying most was that this person said, because you didn't say those things, therefore you're just as bad as the Clintons. So it was a little terrifying. But listen, so here's the thing. And I know you and I have spoken about this a little bit. Uh, fake news is not new. It really is. It's been going on, God, at, you know, for a very long time. And one of the examples that I always think, going back into the 70s, of an example of, we think it can't happen here. It was never going to happen in Chile. It was never going to happen with the most stable democracy in South America, where people were extremely courteous, rule of law was worshipped, everything could be handled with a handshake and a discussion, sir, ma'am, polite, genteel culture. And within a short period of time, with the interference of another country, the USA, um, they upended all of that. There were fights in the streets. There were people beating each other up. There was a coup that happened shortly after. And this was all through two things. One is manipulation of the environment itself, creating chaos via the CIA and the Nixon administration, right? Uh, including an economic, an engineered economic collapse. But it was also putting the newspapers on the payroll so that they would blame all of the chaos and all of the economic problems onto the group they wanted to target, which was Allende and his supporters. And, so, and people were so polarized by this point, the country just virtually tore apart, the democracy crumbled, and you had a dictator in there for years. Well, let's hope that Mr. Trump doesn't think that Bill English is another Allende. <laughs> Mark, can I come back to a point that you raised earlier? You talked about um, requiring Facebook and Google to fund fact-checking. Um, what capacity does the news media itself have to fact-check? You know, we talk about the journalism of verification. We talk about triangulation, getting not one source, not two sources, but three sources on important stories. Chloe talked about the financial model, the the the, um, uh, the loss of, of manpower and so on. Uh, have we lost the capacity to do our own fact checking? I certainly think we've lost some of the capacity, uh, absolutely. Um, I think during the US elections, I think the New York Times had 30 full-time fact checkers um, uh, working uh, so, you know, that, I mean, when I read that, I just, you know, the sort of jealousy and envy um, oozed out of me, really. I mean, that, you know, most newsrooms don't even have half that many journalists, full stop. Um, so to be able to have the luxury of running uh, that sort of fact-checking operation would be fantastic. I think, though, there's another point here. We've been talking about fake news and the mainstream media being duped. Basically, most um, fake news doesn't go anywhere near the mainstream media. It goes straight through social media channels. And that, that's Facebook and Twitter and Google through YouTube. Um, that's their responsibility to do something about that. And I think they've have been very, very slow to respond to this. You know, essentially, um, a while back, um, Facebook changed from having humans doing fact-checking to algorithms doing it. And that's where a lot of the trouble started. That's what allowed the Macedonians to click through. They've also allowed it to be supported with an advertising model. Um, now, they, they are taking steps now, but some of the steps are pretty pathetic. I mean, they, they published in France and Britain, um, you know, 10, 10 tips on how to recognise uh, fake news. Well, I read the 10 tips, and, you know, if, if you don't, if you couldn't think of those yourself, you, you know, you're pretty hopeless. Mm -hmm. So, um, and interestingly, they had to do it through traditional media, um, not actually through their own channels. So I, I, I don't know why, particularly in this country, we let these organisations away with... Um, their lack of investment with, with not even a whimper. I mean, at least the Europeans, um, uh, you know, having a bit of a go and, and reaping a big 
a reward in terms of all the money going into fact-checking. This country, nobody says anything much. I mean, I've said some stuff and everyone goes, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I've said um, some stuff too, but <laughs> same thing. Same thing. No one's really Chloe, interested, is it? As a future legislator, <laughs> <laughs> can we, can we legislate <laughs> them to be responsible in that regard? Um, I just actually wanted to touch on a point uh, that's kind of been raised by everybody. Is uh, You're talking about the fact that, yeah, it is social media is kind of the wild west at the moment, and that seems like the extent of kind of privatisation uh, and kind of the free market model as well. Uh, and that that does seem to be a major issue where we've placed uh, kind of the responsibility in the hands of citizens to discern uh, what is fake on their newsfeed versus what is real. Uh, meanwhile, you know, we've stripped away uh, the education around, uh, you know, civics. <laughs> uh, I've been around the country and spoken to large amounts of different demographics and I consistently find groups of adults who I have to explain how our government works to. Uh, and I, I think that that's a major issue is that we have a lot, uh, we have a very low information, well not comparatively, but we're starting to get a very low information citizenry and that's problematic uh, Yeah, where people are confronted consistently with information which they have to shift through critically. Uh, so yes, uh, I mean of course we can legislate it away, uh, but what I would be, cons yeah, I mean you can you can do what Theresa May is currently proposing, uh, it's not something that I think that I would support, uh, but yeah I, I, th I really think that this, not necessarily the solution, but part of the solution here, uh, the fourth estate is one part of a functioning democracy, we need to see our citizens who are properly engaged and informed and able to sift through that false information. I would like to concur with that. Uh, so in the United States, we used to have this thing called the Fairness Doctrine, and it wasn't perfect, but it mandated that in broadcast that you had to treat controversial issues, not one-sided. And um, y you had to have a range, and you were supposed to dedicate a certain amount of time to true public affairs, all of this sort of a thing. Well, that was upended in about 1987. And roughly about that time. And that was roughly the same time that you saw the rise of the shock jocks and the rise of hate radio and the rise of these, and simultaneously there was a, um, a deregulation of the mergers. And so right now you see a company like Sinclair buying up more and more media, which had been going on for quite some time and mandating a particular slant and because that is, as Chloe says, the economic model, the market rules, there's no consideration for what that could mean. Overcoming that is going to be the long game, I think. But in the short term, let's now open well, it funding. to the floor. It's just funding. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and a few other things yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, let's now open it to the floor. Now, we've got a couple of microphones. One microphone, two microphones. Thank you. Right, now, um, please do put a question mark at the end of what you have to say. Um, and and, and Su if Suzanne's not going to let go of the microphone, so she may hold it up for you, but she, um, she doesn't let go. And if you she, wish to fierce. address your question to a particular panellist, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you. <laughs> um, I guess my question is kind of following on from the discussion about the need to be two-sided in, in journalism and who we speak to to get those two sides of stories because I guess the flip side is for some issues, I'm thinking particularly about anti-vaccination debates for example, does do all climate change is another good example, do we get to a point where there's such overwhelming kind of evidence that um, something is a good idea or something exists that by kind of going back to that kind of two-sided model or we have to get the other side of the story that you end up actually giving a platform to enhancing some really crappy science or some really crappy ideas about things and how do we kind of yeah. manage that kind of I guess tension. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that, that's a vexed question because you, you're up against two things. You're up against first of all um, common sense and uh, the arguments of, of good science, perhaps, but also the rights of free speech. Mm. And 
it's not a matter of giving equal time or equal space to, uh, to both sides of the argument, but climate change deniers or anti-vaccination um, supporters still have a right to be heard in some shape or form. Uh, I'd be interested in what the, the panellists think in terms of how you, how you overcome that vexatious question, because it is vexatious. In the United States, again, I'll focus on that because that's where I've been most of my life and what I've studied mostly, the way they handled that debate, what made it so much of what they call false balance, was that they never identified that the deniers were on the payrolls of the fossil fuel industry. And so it made it look like it was one scientist says this, the other scientist says that, when in fact, it was not that at all. And I think that, that this is one of the problems the other is, of course, you're right, when there's 97% of evidence on one side of it and it looks like there's two sides, that part of the understanding needs to be conveyed. Even if you do get, want to give a voice to a person who has a financial benefit at the end of this argument, um, which you, we can argue ethically on one side or the other, there needs to be the context so that people understand why this person is saying what he or she is saying. Corin, you, you must be faced with that from time to time. Uh, it's a tricky one. Uh, I don't think we, well, I don't think we hear a lot from climate change deniers anymore. I think that is maybe over time, proportionately, they have been kind of weeded out, the process. The anti-vax thing obviously has cropped up. Uh, I guess the, the, I'm just trying to think of when examples of when I've come across this. Genetic modifications, one that I've found quite interesting. Um, and having done stories on that, I have found that, uh, and I've been personally attacked for doing a story that was you know, perceived as pro-GM when I was just trying to tell a story, um, and it was perceived as, you know, I shouldn't have you know, put in that person's view. Um, I don't know, I guess it's proportionate. I guess you've got to, uh, once again, as, as a storyteller, you, we've got to weigh up those factors of the 97% of scientists, or you've got, to, you've got to, it's got to be proportionate in some way. I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. Sorry, I just wanted to say, I think that um, there's also increasingly an ethical issue, perhaps, uh, with, you know, the issue, it's increasingly pertinent in the United States of giving airtime to what is perhaps hate speech instead of free speech. And I, I just wanted to highlight that. There are limits to free speech. and we, Including we need to there are no that. two sides yeah. to gravity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there are new, no two sides to lynching. So these things need to be taken into yeah. consideration. Okay. I, I think the anti-vax one is, is a really, really hot one at the moment. And, um, you know, we did a story on that. Um, Mel Reid uh, did a piece on that where she looked at both sides and we got hammered by both sides um, uh, straight away. I, I think, you know, uh, and I, uh, the in your instinct straight away um, as an editor is to go nowhere near it, is to just go, we're right out of here. Um, but that is also sort of a gutless thing too. So you, you have to take uh, that into account. One of the interesting things about the anti-vax thing is that autism rates are exponentially increasing at an at a unbelievable rate. Um, no one can explain that, and and that that becomes a, a a bigger story. But it gets bogged down in the vax versus anti-vax situation, and the main story ends up uh, getting ignored. What's actually driving uh, autism rates? Um, but I think it is a freedom of speech thing. If you shut down one side, um, is is that the media's job to do that? I, d I don't think it is. Next question, uh, down down this end. Oh. Um, kia ora. So Chloe, I just wanted to go back to something that you said. You were talking about a lack of public funding in journalism, which I totally agree is a problem. But then you said that the lines of journalism are being blurred because of blogging with people like whale oil. But isn't there another side to that? Like, I mean, personally, I think blogging has also ripped open political, personal and social space for many marginalised people to speak out and tell their stories. And doesn't that matter? And 
and isn't that important as well? Like there's just two sides, so I just want want to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's been social media and the internet have democratised the way that we share information and obviously allowed us to disseminate different voices that don't appear in the mainstream and I think that that's incredibly important. Um, the potential issue with obviously just being free reign for, for everyone, everyone can do whatever they want is, is just that it can become the wild, wild west. But um, And the issue again there is, you know, what is picked up and given that platform because you can have those uh, marginalised or oppressed voices which are absolutely sharing their truths and that's crucially important um, but meanwhile the those spreading hate are given the platform to continue doing so or are spread further because they are more polarising or contentious or interesting um, so yeah I'm, it's, it's a really wicked problem yeah. Oh, on the one, it's ironic, isn't it? On the one hand, you have the enhancement of democracy; on the other, you have the undermining of it. Absolutely. Next question, down. Um, when you, sorry, when you're <laughs> debating these uh, uh, anti-vax or whatever, can can you not just uh, research the facts and put down the facts on both sides? Uh, without necessarily getting the personalities involved. But if you do get the personalities involved, then it wouldn't it be a good idea to show their background or where they came from or who they're representing when they're making these comments? Because then the public can judge for themselves. Yeah, I, think the moment, I think you're right. Seems, but It seems like we, we, we don't really have enough information to make choices. For instance, with the political parties, um, why couldn't you publish the manifestos of each political party so we can read them for ourselves and see what they're offering. Or see well, they do publish them themselves, but um, I think that one of the problems with issues like this is that it's almost impossible to keep personalities out of it because people are determined to be involved. And uh, no, 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 the, the individuals themselves, and I think Corin and, and Mark, you will have found this where you have an issue and people leap in and your ability to keep personalities out of it is really, really difficult um, because of the, the, the people and the, um, uh, the, the strength of opinions that those people hold. Uh, I think it's very difficult to do. Uh, and plus, as always, often two sets of facts. I mean, um, you know, alternative the whole, facts. Uh, yeah, the whole post, you know, post truth isn't the word of the year for, yeah. for no reason. Um, uh, you know, both sides can produce facts as as they do in the anti-vax debate. Um, you know, it's really hard, and I think it, you go right back to things like the establishment of um, the Science Centre and organisations like that to try and help help you out with the facts. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sorry to be harking on about this um, vaccination debate, uh, but you could say all doctors are compromised because the pharmaceutical industry uh, is heavily interwoven with them, but they don't um, declare that, do they? And we don't really expect them to. Um, so, mm. Well, let's, let's come back now to established fake news as opposed to contested news. Do we have a question directly related to fake news? Thanks. Um, I, I, oh, good. Thank you, um, David Roby, um, Pacific Media Centre. Uh, the um, the events that have been happening this week, I think, quite extraordinary and uh, grossly underreported in New Zealand media. Uh, in the Gulf, the uh, we started with um, absolute um, uh, fake news. Uh, first of all, hacking of uh, news agency News in Qatar. Um, then responses uh, from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain, and. Um, uh, and, and also the United Arab Emirates, and then several days of leaked uh, emails and constant um, um, uh, fake, fake news in this whole process, and, and an extraordinary escalation. Uh, and I find it quite extraordinary that uh, our media is not really responding uh, to this to any great level. But my guess, I guess, my question about an issue like that is that uh, with our cutbacks of uh, media staff um, over many years now, um, and also the cutbacks in our capacity of international media. Yeah, coverage. I would just like to ask the panel what do, you know in, that, in this particular case that what's been happening this, this week uh, with fake news and the implications that it actually has globally um, and and on New Zealand. Uh, I'd just like some responses on that. Thanks. Uh, 
I, I followed that story with interest too, and um, we have been running um, reports on it. I think, you know, one thing I would, I guess, and I don't, I don't think this is the answer, but I'm, I think most people in this room now uh, will have a huge variety of sources, as I'm sure you do, David. Like, for instance, I look at the BBC, um, I look at the Guardian, I look at the New York Times, and it's actually part of the problem that I'm not looking in the Herald for my uh, international news anymore. I'm going straight to the horse's mouth and looking at it. So if you're interested in that subject, um, there is a lot of coverage on it. I think your point is that local media is not really covering it as well, but does it need to, should it? Yes, but don't we have a perspective? Oh. Uh, no. Corin, should it? Absolutely, and it, uh, it was something we picked up on with our Tillerson reporting on the State Secretary. We, it was mentioned in my report initially. Um, One News will run it, but it's not going to be on the top of the bulletin. Uh, there was a lot of interest in that story from our editors. Uh, it, did run, it has been running uh, in our world section, which is after the first break. Uh, but I, I mean, I take your point. It's not going to knock the. It's not going to knock a lot of other things off the top of the news per se. Uh, I, I, I think it's deeply alarming what's happening in Qatar because, uh, I, I mean, I'm inclined to think, you know, there must be some other factors at play in all this other than just the fake news, uh, whether that was an excuse or whatever. Who knows? But it is deeply alarming that um, it that that is it is capable of causing a crisis of this magnitude. Um, you know, hackers essentially. Okay. We're running short on time. I'd like to take at least another couple of questions. Thank you. Annie, I promise you, next one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name's uh, Malcolm Evans. Um, I've been in newspapers for about 50 years, uh, uh, give or take. And uh, I started on the dark side in the advertising department. Then I went to the really dark side and got into being a cartoonist. And uh, I've been twice cartoonist of the year and several times a runner-up. And I only mention that to, to, to uh, establish some veracity for what I believe is the fact that there's never been a time when we haven't been subject, subjected to fake news. In my view, uh, my interpretation of it would be a falsehood made with an ulterior motive, and I use an old word for that, propaganda. Um, having said that, I did really like to, that uh, status quo bias, uh, uh, but less uh, appealing was your assertion that Russia got involved in the election in America because it wanted to have a say in the result. Where's the proof of that? Was that, uh, was that, that, that was, was Maria. Do you, think, yeah. do you think they don't have a, uh, a desire? No, I'm not in the news business. I'm no, in, well, I'm in these, this. These I'm in are, the political and, and analysis these business. These three guys are, and I would have thought they would have ears would have pricked because they want to. They want to. They want to. Uh, they want to hear where your information comes from. I'm waiting for tomorrow's testimony. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, it's a valid. No, no, I'm not it's joking. a valid question. No, it's, it's a valid um, question. But it is a developing. It is a developing issue, and I think that the Comey testimony and the Senate inquiries are going to lead us closer to uh, the truth of that matter. Yes. Um, and I think that we, um, you know, we've had some evidence, and we've had a lot of. Uh, conjecture a lot of opinion but time I think will be to our benefit in determining whether or not that actually happened so Propa there's so there's been quite just terrible, terrible let me just thing, respond you know, a few things on that so there there's quite a bit of evidence of Russian hacking not just in this particular election uh, there are a lot of scholarly papers on this so I'm not m making this up um, there and there are other ways in which uh, it's not just Russia the United States hacks China hacks North Korea hacks uh, the Syrian electronic army hacks uh, Israel hacks I mean this is there is a hacking phenomenon going on right now of pe look you know we were talking about fake news and the effect of fake news I remember a couple of years ago when the Syrian electronic army hacked into Harvard hacked into the New York Times hacked into Associated Press they put out a tweet that said there was a bomb in the White House thus Wall Street plummeted no, on, 147 with, 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 points with the greatest of respect yeah. let's stick to the story that you said so and Russia it, so it, it, that is that is absolutely appalling which without part? any verification and it's it's the same old story tell a lie often enough it becomes a fact and, and uh, i go back to a time when uh, um, um, muldoon's cossacks that in my view was propaganda uh, the gulf of tonkin uh, incident 
was a lie that sent us to Vietnam and killed New Zealanders in the bloody WMDs. We all know about mm. that. Yeah. It just, it, it's, yeah, it's so yeah. very, this okay, is very, look, very, very serious. I understand and I it's, completely respect but I think, your I think, I take your point that yeah. we need verification of these things before we can take them as fact. Um, Annie? Annie. Thank you and thanks for the talk everyone. Oh, you're hanging on to it. I just wanted to come up um, I don't know if you've all been looking at it or if you have any comments on Wiki Tribune, Jimmy Wales's new proposal, which to me seems to draw on the energy and the potential of kind of crowdsourcing as well as using some of the rigour of traditional journalism. And to me, it seems to be, if anyone can do it, because, you know, obviously Wikipedia has been so successful. I wonder if Jimmy could. But it seems to me, I think he's going to hire something like 45 established journalists. But effectively, their information would be fact-checked and crowdsourced, which I think one of the really good things, and I don't agree that, that you know, online news is the sloppy ones. Often I'm finding online news... BuzzFeed, certainly The Guardian Online, are doing better than traditional mainstream media, often in breaking stories or, or being as accurate. I mean, I think everyone slips up and, and also does good work. But I, I thought that that model was an interesting one, and I just wondered if anyone had looked into it and isn't thought that, of it. Isn't that basically what you were talking about, although you said Facebook and Google them, themselves should do it, and I, I agree they should, but is that, no, 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 but is, is the Jimmy Whale initiative an alternative to um, social media that we can't trust to do the job that, uh, that you're asking of it? Yeah, it could be. Um, I don't really know enough about that proposal to, to comment on it, but I, I, I think it, it could be. And uh, I think the point is we have to look at new ways, and that's the point. I don't think we've got the answer yet. Um, yeah, I'm just a bit down on Facebook and Google because they pay no tax and, um, you know. But um, I, I, I think there is new... And it, and it comes also back, doesn't it, to the um, ownership structure of media, which, you know, you talk about a lot, Gavin. And um, we have to look for new models all round mm. because the old ones uh, are failing. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing as well, I think, is that... Is that kind of... I, I don't know enough about it, but is it kind of crowdsourcing news through... Crowdsourcing verification. Basically, ah. yeah. it would be proper, proper journalists mm. you know, worldwide sourcing stories, investigating, and then there would be some sort of self-correction or yeah. kind of collective correction as occurs with Wikipedia. Because I, I definitely think in the way that uh, the news model is, is having to change because uh, people aren't willing to pay for their news anymore, really, en masse at least, uh, I do think that we need to be looking at um, the fact that anybody can be a journalist, and I referred to that before as the wild, wild west, uh, but I also think that that potentially presents quite quite a grand opportunity and that we could see perhaps, you know, academics um, taking on uh, the role of journalists in certain stories or otherwise. So I, I think it's a really exciting idea, yeah. Right. One last question. Oh, who are we going to choose? Over here, Jeff Kemp. Lucky last. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, this is a question for anybody, really, but um, it strikes me that, uh, and it maybe goes back to a point Chloe made earlier on, it, it strikes me we're having a panel under the title we have uh, because of a particular use of fake news, which is the use of the accusation of fake news as a political strategy in itself, which actually has nothing, or in, in a way is reverse of uh, um, what we've been talking about, because it's uh, an attempt to re rebut, well, can I verify this? An attempt to rebut the truth by a, 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 a fairly empty accusation. I mean, can you see this happening in the New Zealand election this year? Absolutely. That was, I think that is my main worry. And we're seeing it already. Uh, we've already seen Winston Peters use the term alter alternative facts. We've already seen him call now call polls fake. I mean, he's reveling in it because he 
likes to make the media a villain. Mm. Uh, it suits his purposes to um, devalue us in any way he can, pick a fight with us, and then use his own channels to push his own message. Mm. message. So it, it is absolutely, I think, it's going to be a, a major issue in this campaign. Yeah, that, that's really what is quite terrifying is the kind of the obfuscation of you know what is real versus what is fake. And as you, if you tell a lie enough, it becomes the truth. Uh, and that's what frightened me about um, Trump's administration is them, you know, pushing the fake news and the alternative facts or whatever. His supporters then get so confused that he becomes the only authority. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's that's what's really scary to me. Uh, rather than ending on a dystopic note, <laughs> <laughs> um, it has had the beneficial effect of making the Washington Post and the New York Times even better papers than they were. Mm. And they are coming up to the mark. And I think other media... They have a lot to make up for that. after the yeah. Iraq War. Yeah, go. <laughs> 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 um, but I think that... It, there are checks and balances that are that are possible, but because we've run out of time, let me just end on on this note that perhaps the cure for fake news is for us to make sure that we think with our heads and not our hearts. Think critically rather than what we want to be true. Uh, and we need to inculcate into our younger people uh, and into our older people, <laughs> that your preconceived prejudices aren't necessarily the best gauge of what's true and what isn't. So on that note, can I ask you to thank the panellists in the usual way. Thank you.